Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we are waiting for you. Please come back <laughs> to the audience. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Okay, thank you for coming back. And we also want to thank Kenny for uh, cooking cakes for us. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yeah? Okay, sorry for being late because we need a better uh, quality picture and we put a black curtains behind it. And yeah, I, I hope it's now better. <laughs> And uh, thank Kenny for the cake. And uh, our next speaker will be uh, Denise Ferris. I won't be introducing her uh, with the background because we saw her yesterday and uh, we already saw some photographs downstairs from her. So I just, okay. yeah, welcome. Thanks, Anastasia. Okay, thank you. Ah, okay. uh, quick. Uh, hey, that one. Okay. Okay, hello. So I'm uh, looking for page one, and that would be a really good start, wouldn't it? Okay. So I'm going to talk quite a lot about photography and art, because uh, actually, the reason I'm here is that I know very little about heritage, uh, certainly in academic sense. So. Kyandra, the place that I'm speaking about, is an abandoned mining township on the banks of the Yukonbeen River, nestled high in the Australian Snowy Mountains. In 1859, gold was discovered at Kyandra. It's an isolated series of open valleys among mountains exposed to wind, weather, and usually snow. In winter 1860, 80 Chinese miners arrived, and their numbers swelled to over 700. But a decade later, just about 150 remained, but they were, in fact, half of the residual population of Kyandra at the time, a small little town. 20 years after that, two stores, shops, owned by Tom Ah Yan and George Ah Chi were central to, in fact, that small community. Tom Ah Yan, who's buried in Kyandra, had seven children, and through his descendants in the district, a lineage lives on. That lineage, therefore, lives on in us and on in our Australian identity. From the bustling 1860s, the township declined and the last resident moved away 100 years later in the early 1970s. Now uninhabited, on the ground at the main Chinese camp between two large rock outcrops overlooking the river, there are fragments of domestic lives. Shards of pottery. No. Broken glass, scraps of tin, and rusty wire. In the landscape, stone water races, dams, and modified waterways remain as monuments to the Chinese and to their mining practices. Ironically, the physical evidence of the miners endures, while their recorded presence is overlooked. And in fact, our understanding of their lives, aspirations and fates is completely absent. So I'll tell you four stories. The stories are mine and theirs and ours and ours. Mine, story one. 2011. I returned from China's Pingyao International Photography Festival and sitting in the Kyandra Courthouse, which was the, the only building that had been refurbished at that time, heard an Aboriginal elder mention the Chinese gold miners who'd been there. I thought in that instant about connection between their place and that place, China and my place, this place. I started photographing, walking the land, reading research about Kyandra, and helped by an enthusiastic heritage officer in the national parks, um, identified Chinese sites. Previously, I'd, I'd understood Kyandra simply as a ski place, as an abandoned town where 
snowy mountain scheme workers lived. Uh, so it's in fact a many layered, quite contested site. And uh, the way I understood it uh, was about to take a radical change. In Kyandra, standing on a rocky ledge, the sleep slid down the glass of my lens, pointed towards the eastern Chinese camp, discernible between clumps of large and smaller boulders. Focusing intently on the space between wipe and blur, a wind blast knocked me to the ground. I thought about men living under canvas and clambering into my four-wheel drive, headed towards shelter and warmth. In 2012, I exhibited the photographic series, Celestial Spaces, which I made during a Kyandra residency, and I, and I exhibited that at the Pingyao International Photography Festival in China. I hoped in Pingyao that even one of the thousands, the thousands that saw the show, would recognize a familial connection to an isolated corner of New South Wales, an isolated corner of New South Wales where these people went more than a century before. No one came forward. So this next part of the presentation uh, is actually about the work Celestial Spaces. Now, the work that I made, Celestial Spaces, which some of you have seen downstairs, informs my thinking about the second project, which I'm, we're just beginning, and which is the reason that I'm here, because uh, it occurs to me that I'm now what seems to be in a heritage space rather than a fine art space. So this photograph, surveying the mind landscape, establishes place and shows my first sight encounter with Kyandra. It brings into notice aesthetic subjectivity's relationship to my practice, what I saw and how I see. The pragmatic use of land for mining is also quite clear. The weather and the landscape, place, are introduced um, as aspects of my account, of speakers in my account. They call emotion and they call location. In the broader context of identity, Simon Pugh makes the point about landscape symbolic uses. Pugh says, landscape. Landscape is stood as a surrogate for the more politicized notions of nationhood, a displaced expression of sentiments of attachment which are denied expression elsewhere, and as a source of spiritual strength, a moral therapy, end of quote. This view of landscape's emblematic role in national identity is corroborated in Amory Willis's chapter, Nation as Landscape, in her book, Illusions of Identity. In all kinds, she says, in all kinds of contradictory narratives, a national character is seen to spring from the land, timeless, tough, resilient, and imprint itself on people who have so recently inhabited it, end of quote. The landscape photographs of celestial spaces could assume a coherent, uninterrupted Australian identity. However, any unquestioning attribution of a sole hermetic identity is disrupted, disrupted by the existence of the residual handmade landforms and discernible landmarkings that you have just seen. Celestial spaces is a series of 10, 12, 20, whatever, large-scale paired photographs or diptychs. Photographs of, in fact, absence. The word spaces indicates just that, gaps in interpretation and knowledge of the enigmatic site, where otherworldly skies bring down to earth tempestuous weather. So the word celestial is also sort of summoned. The left photograph in each diptych foregrounds the working sites of the Chinese miners. The partner photograph on the right shows shards, or the archaeologists call them sheds, of ceramics, bowls, pipes, cups, and pots evacuated from the Chinese dwelling places, domestic material touched and used by the Chinese miners in daily life. Walking the desolate paddocks of the abandoned town of Kyandra, only absence remained, wherein once there had been congested cheek-by-jowl presence. What my photographs could display 
I came to clearly realize was their own incapacity to offer a comprehensive explanation of the Chinese miners' stories. These narratives remain missing, and this is the catalyst for the future project, which we call, at the moment, Visible Voices. Through misalignment, the formal construction of the photographic series needed to make clear the spaces in our existing understanding. There is a forced encounter in the diptych arrangement. While inviting consideration and making sort of pseudo-formal connections, it was questions rather than answers that would be the conceptual key to these photographs. But of course, these are fine art photographs, unadorned and unexplained. Just opposed uncomfortably, these photographs are meditations on our lack of awareness. Their muteness suggests an exclusion of the Chinese gold miners from the social record. The title, Celestial Spaces, addresses both unearthly presence and expanses. Spaces sky and gaps, the words are ambiguous. The celestial or otherworldly lingers around traces of previous habitation. Worn ground, littered with tin, stone hearths, water races evoke occupation. The idea of space is intertwined with place. Liz Wells, the photo historian, teases out the meanings of space in her book, Land Matters. Wells says, quote, space is conceptually complex and sometimes apparently contradictory. It may refer to that which is not known and thus cannot be precisely categorized, end of quote. The language of the title, Celestial Spaces, flags to a viewer that there are uncertainties. The forced connection of these two unalike views foregrounds disparate ways of both looking, in other words, two photographic viewpoints, that way and that way, up and down. The formal strategy that breaks aesthetic rules signals imaginative thinking is required with very much active viewing going on. Collections have long formed our knowledge of the past. And the diptych also reveals two methods of collecting visual evidence. The image, the photographic image, the visual, and the material evidence is also depicted. Talking about this work as landscape photography, um, we can think about uh, the kind of postmodern uh, grounded aesthetics that landscape photography in a postmodern uh, photographic context uh, always thinks about formal thematic concerns, but always is situated within socio-historical context. It's very rare that landscape photography is torn out of its historical or social context now. Susan Sontag, of course, is effusive about the limitations of photography. Sontag said, Photographs are often invoked as an aid to understanding and tolerance, but photographs do not explain, they acknowledge." End of quote. It is this constraint on photographs and their malleable meaning I used as a trope in celestial spaces. I challenge the enduring expectations by viewers that photographs inevitably, ipso facto, reveal evidence, and that this information subsequently Ma manifest knowledge, and that non knowledge leads to understanding. On the other hand, photography is successful in bringing forth perspectives on the world through its evident selections and its clear-cut acts of choosing. Putting aside Sontag's view of photography's constrained possibilities, Sarah Parson notes, writing on Sontag, quote her, all art is empathetic in that the making of art necessarily acknowledges something worth preserving in the subject." End of quote. This drawing to attention through vision is crucial to all my efforts. Liz Wells says, quote, vision with all the weight of the double entendre 
associated with the notion constitutes a form of knowledge. Furthermore, the act of observation brings into being what is being observed, end of quote. So it's that call of attention, that um, paying of attention, or the honouring, as I'll mention later. The social context during the gold rush migration in Australia included the publication of Charles Darwin's The Origin of the Species. This is not insignificant in view of the book's impact on thinking about attitudes to race and culture. In Inventing Australia, Richard White argues that The Origin of the Species, quote, was very much a book of its time. Darwin's theories also suited the social order. For the rest of the century, social Darwinism, as this misapplication of Darwin's ideas came to be called, was used to justify the oppression of one group by another, end of quote. From the 1850s, the increasingly poisonous visualization of the Chinese in Australia would have an impact on the community and the township of Kyandra. The circumscribed location of the Chinese camp and its separation from the township raises p issues that are pertinent to current migration waves in Australia. So the Chinese were actually moved from the main town to the eastern section, quite away from the township where they lived in their own kind of Chinese camp. Very reminiscent of some things that happen now. The socially prescribed arrangements for living and for dying in Kyandra continue to resonate now, as I will show uh, later. Oh. Okay. Story two, theirs. So why do the questions raised by celestial spaces matter? So what? The partnership of Tom R. Yan and Catherine Warts, their seven children and their descendants is recorded. At that time, different religions and ethnic groups were buried in different parts of the Kyandra Cemetery. Recently, someone relocated Tom R. Yan's freshly handwritten grave marker adjacent to the gravesite of his wife, Catherine Johanna Warts, in fact, uniting them in death. Uh, I don't believe Tom Ayan is actually buried in Kyandra at all anymore. He might have a grave marker, but um, it was um, pretty usual to, um, to in fact, uh, rebury um, people's remains in China. I'm not quite sure about Tom Ayan, but. This gesture here, which moves this marker near Catherine Watts's um, grave site. So it, it, to publicly restate the connection between Tom Ah Yan and Catherine Watts is a statement about devoted interest from someone. The gesture recognizes dormant narratives that await activation and the importance, in fact, of setting the record straight. Actually, in an interesting aside, um, when uh, Tom Ah Yan and Catherine Watts are living in Kyandra, one of their children, Maggie Yan, uh, could be conceptualised as the first Australian ski champion, because in fact um, she was a she won all the ski races in Kyandra. So it's really interesting to to think that the first Australian ski champion was, I know lots of you people think there isn't snow in Australia, there, is, there are very large snow fields, they're all in national parks. But um, yes, Maggie Yan, who was um, from a German mother and a Chinese father, was the first Australian ski champion. I, I really like the idea, actually. So the construction of an Australian identity with authenticity is a powerful inducement to unfold history stories. Feeding into a far more complex national identity than is currently acknowledged, these narratives, these stories will reveal and include some currently missing from the social register. OK. 
Okay, story three, ours. By Easter 2013, all four of Kyandra's remaining buildings had been refurbished and were open to the public, including former residents for the first time in decades. So residents who'd lived there and raised some of their children there who were snowy um, hydro electric scheme workers, um, uh, not, not really any of the miners from obviously the earlier days, that had, that had all finished, but um, residents in the next layer of um, heritage, if you like. I showed celestial spaces in the courthouse where visitors streamed into the room, sheltering from the bitter cold. Among these visitors, I noticed a man with Chinese features. As he looked at my photographs, I engaged him in a discussion of their origins. In a few words, he provided me with what I had failed to obtain in China, a corporal link to the past. Simon C., who's pictured here with me, told me he was the great-great-grandson of a man named Chi, one of the, the 1860s Kyandra gold miners. Exhilarated, amazed, and emotional, this was the foothold in the present I had sought, providing an arc to the Chinese gold miners, miners of an unexamined past. Simon's story of his family, the Cheese, nourished my expectations for the public exhibition of my series. This familial connection offered me another motivation to the question, so what? Celestial spaces, oh, there's me and Simon laughing, was pretty wild. Made me, made me cry, actually. Anyway, so celestial spaces was a kind of honoring attention. Photography's power that Gail Jones, protagonist in her book, 60 Lights, equates with, quote, a kiss because it is devotional, physical, end of quote. Showing respect and taking notice, the photographs of celestial spaces signified the omission from the public record, called us out on the gaps in our record, called us out on the overlooking of the Chinese immigrants. But nevertheless, it could not fill those gaps. The next project, Visible Voices, which is the working title, needed to achieve that. And so begins a project to populate these spaces in the imagination of an audience, which is gathered because the subject matter and its protagonists captivate them, move them as an audience emotionally, and make them emotionally available to the stories that we will research. So, the next project is a very different project, and it is um, a group of disciplines. And uh, while it's foregrounded in art, um, it has uh, a range of people uh, from a team that I have formed. So Visible Voices is a collaborative project rather than multidisciplinary, a team who have strong disciplinary interest in Kyandra. These disciplines collaborate by contributing their disciplinary perspective to the whole. They make kind of like a multi-layered rainbow cake, layers perhaps distinct or combining as an entity in the virtual museum that we are going to make. Visible Voices will explore the synergies also of those interpretive frameworks as part of the research questions. The project will trace knowledge and understanding and make a two-way dialogue from the perspective of Chinese history, inviting Chinese interpretations and familial stories. The project aims to examine the role of art and scholarship, to historiography and to the tension between evidence and imagination. Participating disciplines include history, archaeology, museology, heritage, computer science, and visual art. With diverse research disciplines come different modes of collecting, of course, intimate history, oral history, archaeological evidence, museology, and um, heritage, hopefully, as a verb. The new media technologies of virtual reality and hyperlinked web-based information offer a way to create a browser-based virtual place. Virtual places have the ability to evoke a sense of presence or being there in users. Establ establishing a non-destructive visitation to and experience of the site and its 
monumental wonders, is a core outcome of this project. So the site is fragile, the audience uh, is global, and uh, it will be non-visitation for obvious reasons. Virtual places therefore offer the twin benefits of connecting remotely located people to particular places in an experiential way while also protecting fragile sites. Virtual places are not limited to 3D depiction of things and places. Additional information in the form of text, sound, images and movies can also be incorporated into a virtual place, creating a multi-dimensional resource. Our animation expert, Kit Devine, who's on our team, uses the term enhanced virtual reality, which combines interactive virtual reality with the internet, internet and digital databases to create rich, rich layers of virtual places that significantly enhance the user experience, but in an emotional, immersive, and therefore crucially meaningful way. This aims to position the viewer inside the work, involve other senses like sound and, of course, silence. So we're now at the point of having formed the team of kind of looking, uh, looking at what's needed, what's kind of crucial, how do we go ahead with this. If the indexical and imaginative possibilities of photography are central to the articulation of the mining site, how can the practice of photography mobilise the contribution of all other disciplines? In picturing place, photography in the geographical imagination, Joan Swartz considers the photographic archive over a range of photographies. She says that um, to understand how pho photographs were and continue to be part of the practices and processes by which people come to know the world and situate themselves in space and time is, is quite crucial. The pressure on photography's factuality, our assumption about uh, its connection, its indexical, indexical connection to its referent, to where it came from, offers a powerful um, representing medium, something that can possibly, oddly enough, represent absence through being such a representational medium. The Visible Voices project needs to activate remembrance and will culminate in gathering an audience stirred by a virtual site of thinking and memory, igniting collective remembrance of the Chinese gold miners. French historian Pierre Nora makes a distinction between history and memory. Nora says memory is, quote, a bond tying us to the eternal present, end of quote. Whereas history as rep representation, um, he suggests, may be less fluid and possibly more static. Nora suggests that sites of memory require a, mi a will to remember. It is this will to remember that must be triggered by the virtual museum through positioning the, digi the digital data of the photographs or the videos, sound, using timing and aesthetic effects of light and darkness. The space of imagination must be constructed to be compelling, affective, and while inviting broad interpretation, direct attention and thought, attracting the viewer to feel, but crucially to think. How can photography of place direct the sympathies of an audience? Wells says, Photography, uh, photographs sp splice space into place. The landscape and land and their stories do convey place. When asked in a recent interview what photography offered anthropology, I could decisively respond, well, at least place, a sense of place. The landscape and place in Kyandra are dominated by absence and missing narratives, as I've said. Place can also stand in as a kind of portrait of the Chinese gold miners including the place of their past through interactive dialogue in the project's cons construction, so the place they were before this. Cultural landscape, reading the land and the site offers both information and a site for memory. The stone mining mounds and residue left behind by the Chinese miners, who are tantalizingly absent, continue to evoke the hands that built them. 
these hands laboriously touching each stone. Geographer Karen Till argues that place can facilitate atonement. She explains, quote, through placemaking, people mark social spaces as haunted sites where they can return, make contact with their loss, contain unwanted presences or confront past injustices, end of quote. Depiction of the land at the centre of former lives is a potent site for reflection on that past. And I've heard a couple of people yesterday mention Laura Jane Smith, um, who wrote uh, Uses of Heritage. Actually, I, I have to acknowledge that I've, I've actually got the chapter uh, in my folder about place, which I haven't managed to read. I, I keep going to read it and don't get to it. Um, uh, Laura Jane actually works at the school next to our school, and she, she I will have to read the book, but, um, you know, she makes some really, I think I've heard her give a conference paper uh, when I was sort of touting for uh, people to join in this project. I did an, a range of small conferences, uh, symposiums, right out of my discipline, and um, her her, some of her explanations about the uses of heritage are, are really quite interesting and I've, as I've also heard, are slightly contentious. But she does in fact note that the natural world um, is a witness to the lives lived and passed over and it's certainly something that I will make use of in the next project. Using the land's weather in a sombre and allergic tone can be um, a space of reflection on the poignancy of a mission. Weather also ties into time-based work, of course, when you're making it in terms of video and moving image. The wild and diverse weather conditions of Kyandra can be used to represent both endurance and change. While the past will not be reconstructed, narratives can be made by con conjuring images, images of heritage and images of belonging. This raising of the past, when I, when I think of that, I actually think I actually mentally think the raising of the dead actually, but um, is an evocation reinforced by photography's indexical relationship to its references, to its reference. Images of vacancy are evidence of a missed encounter in history, a missed encounter uh, by me to photographing them and by us knowing their history. That possible encounter is long gone and has no prospect. Opportunity has passed and photography has just non-existence to represent. The images constitute certificates of absence. Reproducing absence, a strategy used in many physical sites of remembrance, internalizes memory. This project, rather than offering a fixed monument or memorial act acting as a cenotaph, allows memory to be prompted through a virtual site. Time-based art, rather than static memorials, encourages viewers to remember and use their ima imagination continually on an ongoing basis, so that it is active, rather than something that needs to be returned to physically at any time. Sontag also questions memory, um, and saying, in quote, perhaps too much value is assigned to memory and not enough to thinking. And she's really referring to the kind of um, active space of engaging with images, which I am very keen on. Viewer participation and contribution of um, information and perspectives on that material is something that will be uh, part of the actual virtual museum. So there has to be, um, the hosting needs to be constructed well so that you can actually deal with the feedback. This extends into further data collection um, and gathering possible narratives of associated uh, viewers, of course, who, as I said, can be anywhere in the world. So, my conclusion about being there. 2014, and we're uh, in between our day jobs, trying to prepare an Australian Research Council grant application, uh, building a team, situating the research questions, grappling with ideas um, about heritage, some of us, uh, investigating uh, possibilities and as chief investigator I'm seeking participation from institutional and government partners in an environment with a very conservative both state and federal government. So the um, National Parks and Wildlife, the people who run the National Park are very interested and that's great 
and the um, Chinese Heritage Association of Australia, uh, who are grassroots community uh, basis, are really interested in the project, and that's also really great. So that story really, I think, is about broad stakeholders, the people of the state and the people um, of the nation, so reaching right out into a, a very different space than I'm used to certainly communicating with. I hope that's going to be a good story with a good ending. In Picturing Place, there's a section on colonial encounters, and it has a chapter on Egypt through the stereoscope, stereoscopic views published in 1905. These images reconstructed scenes with immense depth, which at the time was really privileged as a sort of an index of meaning. You know, it was like more, if the more real you could get it, the more great it was. Um, these views were championed as, in fact, superior to being there, absolutely better than actually being there. And it's because they offered aerial perspectives, triangulated views connecting to maps and commentary not afforded the average tourist. While our project is going to use current technologies and it will look for immersion, it is definitely not the flyover or the surround image in 3D or all that whiz-bang stuff about animation that will offer value and success. That will all be there, but that will not, in my view, what makes this project come off. It is the measure of the interaction and the affective involvement the work will engender that will be its